Okay, I'm here to talk today about Middle Tennessee Electric's uh, project that they did to get to state zero while keeping versions intact. Uh, as Laurence mentioned, my cohort in crime, uh, Anne Louise, is here at the conference but has fallen ill, so she would, uh, is not able to make it today. Uh, but I will be covering her slides and sort of uh, walking you through this. So uh, we'll talk briefly through some different areas and try to give you a, a good presentation of, of uh, the challenges of this project and the success that inevitably came out of it. So Anne Louise, again, she's the uh, GIS coordinator there. We've been working with Middle Tennessee for a couple of years now. Uh, she works all, all the side from the IT representation to the uh, business users, as well as manages all the projects that go on there. Uh, my name is Sky Perry, and I work with SSP Innovations, and I'm one of the principal consultants there. Uh, we are an Esri and Schneider Electric, or I'm an Esri and Schneider Electric technical architect, uh, and I've been focusing on uh, ArcGIS Online and several other things uh, for several years. I've been working with Middle Tennessee specifically for the last three years. So one of the key business drivers, so why did we need to do this project? And if you've worked in this industry uh, and you understand Esri versioning, you will understand very clearly the challenges that Middle Tennessee faced. Uh, they use Esri Core, they've got ArcFM plus Designer uh, for their editing, so they're doing a, a number of designs uh, each and every day, and that's how they post data to the back office system. They've got a custom web viewer for back office viewing, ArcFM viewer in the field, and they use Responder, which is Schneider Electric's outage management system, uh, for managing outages on a daily basis. So this project was used as a catch-all for three types of different and related changes within the geodatabase. The first was data model changes. Now, you don't need to drop uh, your versions necessarily to make data model changes, but there are certain data model changes that do require uh, to be at state zero. Uh, another case was mass data updates. If you do that in a heavily versioned system, such as Middle Tennessee and, again, 1,700 versions, uh, you've got some potential real issues around uh, creating versioned edits that then have to be posted, reconciled, and any conflicts uh, pulled out of the system before that, uh, the performance can be regained. And finally, there's a number of uh, recommendations provided by Esri. They came in and did a consultation around performance and some re recommended enhancements to the system to really enhance performance overall that did require getting to state zero. I uh, worked with John Alsop over there. If you haven't worked with him, he's fantastic. Uh, really does a lot of the uh, system assessment towards performance. So designer, if you any, any designer uh, users in the room, but as many other users of versioning in general uh, throughout the community today, uh, it uses the concept of long transactions, right? This allows us to create a version for uh, design or edits within the system and keep that version for some period of time until those edits are complete when they can be posted up to SD default. Uh, Middle Tennessee typically runs 1,700 to 2,000 versions at any given time, uh, and they exist from an initial design through as -built. So this could be one day, but it could also be over the period of a year where these versions are outstanding. So it's very important to keep this uh, state tree intact, keep it reconciled, and ensure the performance of the system for all the users. So versioning makes applying some changes difficult. Some changes that we're going to talk about here could be made in a version environment, but it would create a ton of edits within the state tree that would have to be reconciled down, and others cannot be made in a version environment at all. I'll give you just a few quick examples uh, from the business side. Uh, so creating related uh, records, overhead and underground secondary, they used a quantity field at the top level, but designer doesn't really utilize a quantity field. It always sees a quantity of one when it's pushing out a length. So they wanted to create a, a related record scheme uh, similar to the primary. It was specifically under secondary. So that was one major change we needed to do and migrate the data. So data model changes plus mass data updates. Another example is duplicating and splitting records, again, around, around quantities that were in the database. So we need to take a quantity of three and split it into three records so that individual records could be retired. This all feeds to finance, uh, as well as the, uh, the actual costing system, the work management, which is SAP in their case, related to the last presentation, uh, to ensure that those uh, bids were going out correctly and that materials were ordered and that the, uh, the crews had the right material. And finally, mass data updates, as we mentioned, uh, you know, th these certainly could be done, and there's even some back-end ways to do it via SQL updates in a version geodatabase, but uh, this was a great opportunity while we were at state zero to be able to plug these in. So with that, uh, I should say the final one here was data model updates. Uh, they wanted to add in some solar form data or solar farm data as uh, generator feature classes within uh, their database. Uh, they were re uh, removing all unused fields. It was an interesting exercise to slim down the database a bit, so all unused data uh, fields across the entire database. Uh, they wanted to convert some classes from the SDE binary format over to uh, SQL Server geometry type. That's a whole separate discussion, but they did a lot of benchmarking against that 
uh, but there were specific reasons to move towards SQL Server as opposed, uh, as opposed to the binary format around being able to interact with the geospatial aspects directly through SQL Server. Uh, if you're interested in that, we could talk about that too. Uh, and finally, implementing ARCFIM voltage levels. They wanted to take connectivity upstream of those distribution circuit breakers and tie them all back to a circuit switcher uh, that would effectively become a joint source at the substation. Uh, basically, when that goes out and they have SCADA events on those devices, they wanted to be able to take you know, three to four distribution circuits out of uh, the system all at once and have the customers roll up to a single incident within the outage management system. And finally, the big one. This was an ESRI recommendation. Uh, back, anybody who implement, implemented on SQL Server in the early days of SQL Server, uh, the recommended model for Mesri was a multiple database model. Uh, you had your SDE database uh, separated from your business data, and they, in fact, had several different business databases. In fact, a total of uh, five different databases existed, and Esri said we could really see some performance benefit uh, as well as some simplification of backups and restoration processes they had by taking those five and putting them into one. Uh, so this was almost one of the biggest ones that you, you just don't do this with versions intact. Uh, this is effectively creating a brand new geodatabase and merging these together. So again, these are some of the business drivers of the challenges to get there. So a lot of change in the geodatabase. Uh, they had accumulated these over several years, kind of leading up to a project to do a mass change to enhance the database. And the changes range from hard to perform to impossible to perform based on having these versions intact. So one of the things that we work with customers on is, is a, a tool called the All Edit State Zero technology, and it's really all around this. And it came out of this inability to do some of these changes in systems that have versions over the years. So you know, I'll kind of take you through some brief portions of the process here, but it extracts all those versions to an external format, allows you to literally delete the versions and compress the state zero, unversion, drop your geometric network, get it basically back to the initial state of a, a pure and, and slim database. It allows you to perform whatever those state zero tasks are and then to recreate the versions just as they existed before the process began. And then finally, some intricacy on the, uh, the designer side. There's a fair bit of XML maintained in their infrastructure that matches to the edit, so we need to keep that synchronized as well. Our goal is that when the business users come back in after this process, they shouldn't see any change within the database, within the system, the application, uh, from Friday when they left. You know, the idea is to keep that seamless. So a quick workflow here, I uh, won't go through too much of this, but uh, basically goes through a process of extraction, applying state zero changes as I've described uh, previously, and then bringing the versions back to life. Uh, the one twist to this though was that we were moving to effectively a separate geodatabase. And if you've ever done this, a new geodatabase, and you copy and paste via our catalog, a relatively simple uh, operation, or perhaps via Python with scripts, right? Uh, if you know the underlying infrastructure, it's creating a new class ID associated with every feature class and object class. So those, those class IDs change when you create the new geodatabase. So that throws some kinks into it, uh, which had to be handled from the single geodatabase merge. So the process they kind of outlined overall, I'll break this down very quickly for you, sort of into smaller sections. The first one was version extraction and model updates. So they all had at state zero standard process uh, was put in place, started off with copying the production database over to a test instance so that we could leave production online as a read-only source for business operations. Uh, then we extracted all the versions of 1706, I think was the final count at production time, uh, into the SSP format and then literally deleted them, as I mentioned, compressed to state zero. Uh, there was a number of processes, actually took a couple of days with the amount of processing to go ahead and apply the data model changes, the mass data updates, uh, the SQL Server merge, it was kind of all put in place, heavily tested, of course. So to do this, the new geodatabase was created. So it was a literally empty SDE schema that was created in a brand new SQL Server instance. So it's a second geodatabase, the data was copied using Python. Any non-GIS data that was not registered with the geodatabase was simply scripted across using SQL Server uh, scripts uh, at the SQL level. Uh, the all edits metadata updates. So this is one interesting change uh, because the schema names were changing between merging those five geodatabases into one. We had to update the internal metadata that tr kept the version data in between. So that was a, a SQL update in between to ensure that the edits were aligned with the new geodatabase format. Uh, they have a fair, fairly heavy custom code base these days, so there was an effort to go through that custom code to ensure the new uh, version of that code referenced the new table name. So not a major effort. Uh, model names were used in some cases, but uh, in a lot of custom code, you'll find a reference to the geodatabase that would need to be uh, re-referenced. Finally, the all-edit standard process brought those back. So recreated the 1,700 versions, again, in the test environment at this point in time. 
uh, data model changes and data updates applied in line. So as those versions are recreated, if, if some of those model changes affected the edited data, those changes were persisted into the versions as they were recreated. And finally, again, that designer XML was updated uh, to ensure that any class name changes and object ID changes, because of course object IDs continue to increment, uh, were applied uh, to ensure it's all synchronized. So the edits came back, new object IDs reinserted into the Schneider process, it really comes back to life and is synchronized together. Next part, of course, Archifim configuration manages those same set of table names and we had to go ahead and apply new configuration around that, uh, match the table names and the designer CU library had been fully updated to match the new data model. So uh, done intermediate, brought back in. The voltage levels were then done. This actually ended up being a, a little bit larger change than we actually expected. They do use Feeder Manager 2.0. Anybody using that knows is that uh, the Feeder Manager IDs are managed in memory, which is uh, ideally this great piece uh, that works very well. But again, this is rolling this up to a brand new source within the geo database, from the distribution circuit breakers all the way up to the uh, circuit switchers uh, or, or the high level circuit breakers, just different subtypes really. But it's a fundamental change in the way these networks are built to a new uh, common source point. Uh, one challenge is they do use the feeder sync process. And the feeder sync process, if you're not familiar, uses these in memory circuit numbers that are tr uh, captured while you're editing. It, it decreases conflicts, increases performance. And after posting a given version, it actually takes those IDs and puts them back into database fields. And that's important because uh, a number of uh, extract processes or uh, analysis processes utilize those fields for uh, extracts and they need, to, they need to pull circuit IDs out. So it writes it back. Uh, some of the interesting changes here though is when we moved to using the ultimate source, they now had a new feeder ID that was being written, uh, which is now a transmission level uh, circuit ID. Uh, that didn't work for the process, so it was actually uh, required just a little bit of customization around the feeder sync process, uh, so we put a new plug in there to actually say, okay, for the extraction process, we want to continue to use our distribution circuit numbers while still maintaining the, the connectivity up to the transmission network. So it kind of got the best of both worlds. Uh, there was a little bit of some tricks in there that uh, got in the way, uh, but it came out okay in the end. So finally, bringing the new geodatabase online. Copy that validated new geodatabase back from the test environment into the production environment. Replace the system store displays or some small tweaks around the, the single geodatabase model. Install that updated software and released to the users. At this point in time, the actual edits had to be put in place uh, with the, uh, the, the transmission connectivity, right? Because the connectivity that's drawn into GIS only went to the distribution circuit breakers previously. So there's new substation bus bar going on on the high side of the breakers connecting back to that common source within the substations. So all the users came in, uh, so the power users I should say, came in and did that over the weekend uh, to ensure that data was pushed out and persisted. So that all worked and we had a, a database back online with designer working, uh, which is a pretty cool thing. We equate this to effectively open heart surgery on an Esri Geo database. Uh, and again, Esri and others had really said this was impossible for a number of years and with these versions we had them back. So then what about Responder? Anybody here who uses outage management with Responder is familiar uh, that there are some probably some additional challenges. Back to the original uh, point I made earlier, the class IDs all changed. So we had new class IDs across the board and those class IDs are used internally by Responder for the mapping of everything from your customers to your outage uh, devices, your fuses, your switches, et cetera, uh, all the way down to the incident location. So uh, everything was mismatched when the database came back online. So we had some scripts to go ahead and read the new class IDs and persist those throughout Responder to allow it to resynchronize. And then the voltage level config, of course, now uh, changed the way that responders saw the network. So some slight config changes there, but it was able to recognize the transmission network as the ultimate source uh, for rolling up those outages. So updated all the other components there, brought those services back online. Uh, the beauty of it was the existing incidents that were there, uh, and responder, again, was kept online and only uh, offline for uh, a matter of minutes. In fact, they went to a failover system and came back online. So it was a very quick piece. All the incidents were, you know, stayed right in place. And with the resynchronization of class IDs uh, and object IDs, it came right back to life. Uh, so I had to heavily test all that, but it was a pretty, a pretty neat implementation of technology uh, to allow them to achieve the goals they needed to have. Uh, Archivim Viewer, they use that in mobile. It's uh, the mobile side. It's an ArcGIS engine implementation. Uh, it's all around new, new extracts, so we had to recreate the extracts from scratch because that core geo database changed, but no real big deal there other than they have five replication sites and a whole lot of field mobile units, but uh, just got that work through and it worked okay. Uh, the clients picked up that new extraction on the next time they would sync, which is ideally in the next seven to 14 days as they came into the office. 
So how did this project go overall? Uh, it was a very challenging pro uh, project. There was a lot of uh, hiccups along the way and new discoveries uh, as we kind of encountered some new technology that uh, isn't often messed with. Uh, but it was deployed over the course of six days in the end, started on a Tuesday, had the system back up by Sunday, ready for a Monday uh, handoff to the users. Uh, it included separate environments, so there's two separate geodatabase environments for designer and responder, which includes uh, full replication via Esri replication to keep the data in sync between the two. Uh, there was also brand new disaster recovery components put in for both designer and the responder environments. So they have full failover to secondary servers in real time transaction uh, mode at the, the SQL server level. Uh, so that was a sort of another, another thing that went in there. Uh, the real you know, lessons learned is that you, you got to test and test and test. When you're doing this much change, there are many challenges uh, there and you have to basically uh, ensure you've got all the, the hiccups worked out. Uh, such a major change and such a, a critical system that GIS has, has become within the utility net uh, group, uh, we needed to ensure that it was going to run smoothly. So that was probably the real key to it. And finally, uh, definitely a shout out to True North, or one of our partners there who does a lot of the web components. Uh, they had to make some updates along the way, very easy to work with. So kind of just addressing all aspects of the overall system. So the system was back online Monday morning. The users were able to open designs. They didn't notice any issues. That was best case. And the user was able to manage the responded outages uh, without any uh, issues. We did align to make sure there was not any major weather rolling in when we did these changes. We wouldn't take it down in that case. Uh, we lucked out there with the targeted week. Avoided storm season. So really quickly, that's it. It was a pretty exciting project. Uh, not without challenges, but uh, to have it go down, come back up, new heart put in place. Uh, very exciting, it was a good success. So Anne Louise's information is here and she would be absolutely happy, she said, to answer any questions that you have for her since she couldn't be here today. Uh, but I'd be happy to take any, uh, any questions with you all today here if you have some for me. Yes, sir. About the database change that you made, you actually put multiple databases into one specific unique geodatabase? That's correct. So if, if, if you've implemented SQL Server early on, you end up with multiple databases. And if you're ever doing backup and restores, for example, you'll have an SDE backup and your business database backup, depending on when you implement it. So we merge those together into a single SQL Server database, which now supports the geo database with different schemas. So you end up with an SDE schema, uh, the process schema, your business data schema, uh, and maybe multiple business data schemas. So different schemas in one database versus individual databases. Yes, sir. Uh, I just wonder, do you have an, uh, other customers besides the one you mentioned? Yeah, we started this uh, on a small level, thank goodness, but we did an uh, Intermountain Rural, uh, which had 300 versions, and that was kind of exciting, and he confided in me after we did it. He said, I didn't think you could actually do this, uh, but we got that done, 1,700 versions here. Uh, we're actually working with a, one of our other partners, Ramtech, uh, on a conflation process, and we're tackling some of the big boys in the country. So our next step is to move to 6,000 versions. And we just signed up a project which will be taking on 9,000 versions. So it's going to get some more exercise as we take on those larger customers. Uh, I am not so naive to think that that will be easy, uh, but it'll be coming up, so it'll be pretty exciting. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time and your attention, for hanging around, and I hope you have a great rest of your conference.